although this conference is uh, concerned primarily with the relationships between photography and science, or should we say photographies and sciences, I would like to introduce a third term in my talk, uh, one of measurement or rather measuring. <clears throat> I don't think, or at least hope, uh, that it will not distract our attention from photography and science, but can in effect provide a meeting ground uh, for these two fields as science becomes photographic and photography scientific precisely through and as various practices and techniques of measuring and commeasuring. Um, references to measurements have uh, turned out in the previous talks and, and um, in, in the debate you just had on, on comparing <clears throat> comparing um, photographs from archives from different uh, time periods. Uh, now, measurement is often seen as a hallmark of the scientific enterprise and a privileged source of knowledge, especially within the natural and empirical social sciences. The emergence of modern systems of measurement historically coincides with the emergence of photographic technologies. Besides their common social, cultural, and economic background, both technologies also share epistemic ideals of precision, consistency, convertibility, objectivity, and universal accessibility. Early commentaries on photography, from Arago to Talbot, from Poe to Holmes, <clears throat> stress the advantage of photography uh, to provide minute, accurate, and commonly scaled data Photographs have been used to measure anything from the brightness of celestial objects to motion or social phenomena. Uh, in her book, uh, Photography and Science, Kelly Wilder aptly summarizes various approaches to measuring photographs in a subchapter sub titled The Impulse to Measure. Uh, photographs depict specific objects at a specific time and in a specific place and measuring photographs can tell us something about these partic those particular objects or their states and conditions. Photographs can be produced intentionally to be measured, <clears throat> or one can even measure photographs that were originally produced for other purposes. To give you at least a short quote uh, from a book that uh, uh, we know uh, all very well, I assume, the very notion that photographs uh, could possibly be measured forms the foundation of various types of scientific photography, such as Raymond spectroscopy and photogrammetry, two methods that bend photographic observation to mathematization. <clears throat> now, Wilder distinguishes spectroscopy as a field that basically dispenses with the pictorial. Measuring diffraction through photography does not produce images that would depict anything recognizable, but rather collects light over time to produce spectral images as quantifiable data. And photogrammetry, which contains visual information alongside the mathematical. In any distance surveying, we need control or orientation points that make it possible to read certain parameters of the scene through its photographs. <clears throat> we can extract measurements from those photographs, while a lot, lot of their pictorial detail can be seen as irrelevant or accidental. Now, the difference between these two kinds of measured photographs can be also described as a difference between cameraless photographs and photographs made with a lens-based camera, or more precisely, with a well-defined and situated camera, where a painstaking precision of camera placement and knowledge of its optical parameters are crucial. We can also move beyond these two kinds of photography, the cameraless and the lens-based, <clears throat> and consider other uh, rather unorthodox cameras that might be called post-lenticular. We heard about one yesterday, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope, which is essentially a large array consisting of several radio telescopes on different places of the Earth. Another recent example <clears throat> can be the Atlas Pixel Detector used at CERN, which is an apparatus one and a half meters long that takes 40 million pictures per second of particle collisions. Now, the scientists who use it talk about it as of a digital camera. They say the detector is like a digital camera trying to take a picture of the birth of the universe. It is a diff different technology, but more or less the same concept. So we, here we have two kinds of uh, photographs and you can feel that I would very often use quotation marks around the word photograph. Photographs that are measured and measurements turned into images that are often understood or presented as kind of photographs. 
Now, in my take on the relationship between photography and measurement, I want to focus on a rather different set of practices and techniques, perhaps more mundane and ordinary, uh, perhaps even pre-scientific in the sense that they haven't yet become coherent and standardized scientific methods, but are no less important because they bring along a very basic form of parametrization of the world and of the visible. I don't want to talk about measuring photographs or measurements turned into photographs, but rather about photography as a means of measurement in itself. Now, this probably calls for a cl clarification of what I mean by measurement or rather measuring. And I understand uh, measuring as a cultural technique. So I want to shortly recall <clears throat> um, a by now canonical definition of the term by uh, cult cultural historian Thomas Macho. Uh, who says that cultural techniques such as writing, reading, painting, counting, making music or measuring are always older than the concepts that are generated from them. People wrote long before they conceptualized writing or alphabets, millennia passed before pictures and statues gave rise to the concept of the image. And until today, people sing or make music without knowing anything about tones or musical notation systems. Counting too is older than the notion of numbers. To be sure, most cultures counted or performed certain mathematical operations, but they did not necessarily derive from this concept of number. <clears throat> so it is this elementary practice of measuring as a cultural technique that interests me and that has, I believe, important implications for the more developed and sophisticated methods of measurement in, this measurement in the sciences. And I want to situate this elementary cultural technique of measuring in a field of visual empiricism and link it with photography and other forms of images. <clears throat> and I will try to do that through a commentary on several images that will hopefully help me to indicate the problem I want to introduce here and that I believe is an urgent one. Uh, we can certainly see a current intensification of measurement when different kinds of metrics, assessments, quantifications, establishing equivalencies are being are now embedded multiscalar <clears throat> and active com components of our everyday lives. They are central to how those lives are ordered, governed and defined. So measurement expands beyond the worlds of science and technology and becomes basically an everyday routine. Uh, and now to show you one of those routines, I <clears throat> want to um, start with this painting by Quentin Matzes, uh, the painting Banker and His Wife, or sometimes labeled Money Lender from 1514. Uh, the simple genre painting from Antwerp that has at the time been changing from a small fishing town into a financial superpower a cosmopolitan harbor where exotic goods and currencies met on similar counters of merchants and dealers. I don't want to go into details of this allegorical masterpiece of the Flemish Renaissance that beautifully illustrates the transition from medieval to the modern world. We can focus only on the scales used here to weigh coins coming from different parts of the world and so to measure the value of one against another. The scales here cease to be the symbol of the scales of justice or the last judgment and rather show the banker's gesture as a nexus of the emerging global capitalist trade <clears throat> for which techniques of standardizing, calibrating and commensurating became crucial. We can find a similar shift from a symbolic or metaphorical use of scales to its more practical and pragmatic meaning in a short but remarkable dialogue by Nicholas of Cusa the dialogue Idiota de Statitis Experimentis from 1450, in English, uh, something like the layman on experiments done with weight scales. Now the dialogue concerns the practical application of weighing in different areas of knowledge and science. Cusanus, or the layman in the dialogue, proposes an empirical research program based not so much on weighing individual things, but rather on comparing their different weights, a program of measurements and the quantification of qualities, which will become dominant in the sciences only later in the 19th century, especially with statistical physics and mathematics. Here is a short example 
uh, of its application in medicine uh, to give you a hint on, on of, uh, what, what the dialogue is about. If you were to allow water to flow through the narrow aperture of a water clock into a basin during the time that you counted the pulse beat of a healthy adolescent 100 times, and if you did a similar thing with respect to a sick adolescent, don't you think that there would be a difference of weight between those two collections of water? Therefore, by reference to the weight of the collections of water, we could ascertain a difference of pulses in the case of someone young, someone elderly, someone healthy, and someone sick. And likewise, we could arrive at a truer knowledge of the illness, for of necessity, there would be one weight with respect to one illness and another weight with respect to another illness. Moreover, if by means of the aforesaid relation between the respective weights of water, a physician were to attain onto the breathing in terms of inspiration and expiration, wouldn't he make a still more precise judgment about someone's physical condition? The layman goes on <clears throat> to list a large volume uh, of things that can be measured minerals, metals, plants, or the amount of water running out from a clepsydra that can be again used to measure other things from heartbeat to musical harmonies. He presents simply a universal method that generates empirical and precise knowledge. And I think it's interesting to read Cusanus's dialogue next to the famous treatise on painting by his contemporary Alberti because this understanding of linear perspective embodies a very similar program of continual comparisons and commeasures. We can never know the thing in itself, but only by comparing it with other things. To make an image of the world is to take a measure of that world. The image is built upon re relations and proportionality. Here is a short illustration for, from Alberti's uh, uh, treatise, uh, which concerns the surfaces of uh, the painting. Uh, for this reason, <clears throat> the surfaces in a painting certainly appear very clear and very bright, but the same proportion occurs there between black and white as occurs in the objects themselves of an illuminated thing compared with a shaded one. All these things then are found out by comparison. In comparing therefore the objects, there is certainly such a power as to make us conscious of what is more, less and equal. Consequently, <clears throat> we say what is great is greater than the small object, very great what is greater than this great object, lucid what is clearer than a dark object, and very lucid what is more lucid than this clear object. So for Alberti, the understanding of things occurs only through comparison and measurement. Probably the most famous link between measuring and image making is of course provided by Albrecht Dürer less than a century later, <clears throat> his treatise on measurement from 1525, which is best known for instructions on precision drawing, was intended as the artist declared in its introduction, not only for painters, but also for goldsmiths, sculptors, stonemasons, carpenters, and all those for whom using measurement is useful. <clears throat> so Alberti says that we can learn by comparison if we have some sort of benchmark or standard. And he himself refers to Protagoras and his saying that man is the model and measure of all things. Thus all pictorial information can be related to human figure or its part or its parts. This is of course a common strategy employed whenever some unusual object is depicted, but still somehow comparable to our human measure. Another strategy relates images to things as they are seen by human eyes. This is especially the case in early microscopy. Here is what I believe is the first example of a magnification, Francesco Stelluti's We Will, uh, from a book published in 1630, which is here juxtaposed with the real size of the buck as if it would crawl on the page next to its magnified version. But the comparison doesn't have to concern only size, of course. Uh, getting back to the relationship between money, currency, and uh, uh, weighing them, uh, we can take as an example price inflation, or namely hyperinflation, which has created its own photographic trope, juxtaposing images of everyday food and household items with piles of near worthless banknotes. One recent example is the Venezuelan Bolivar, 
uh, which hit almost 2 million percent inflation in 2018. At the time, a toilet roll cost uh, 2.6 million bolivars, a bunch of carrots was worth 3 million. Now the photographs uh, visualize the disproportion between a conventional expected price where money is believed to have some real value or substance and the hyperinflated medium of money which ceases to be the measure of anything but its own deterioration. The everyday products provide scale like a human next to a pyramid, a matchbox next to an unusual object. The abstract universality of homogeneous units is confronted with traditional vague and representational measures such as were typically derived from human limbs and labor. So the standard procedure of valuation is reversed here. <clears throat> it is not the amount of money that determines the price of a commodity, but the commodity determines the value of money instead. <clears throat> of course, the images here are framed by a particular narrative, and we are used to similar illustrative pictures, at least since the wheelbarrow money of the Weimar Republic. With a different kind of explanation, we could be looking at so-called singular goods, <clears throat> such as unique and, uh, and expensive carrots. But in our contemporary era of fiat money, where there is no capacity to measure the value of money against an external standard, such as gold, their purchasing power is typically determined by statistical indexes. <clears throat> In his 1975 piece entitled Scaling, Paradoxes of the Re Reference Systems, Peter Bible showed a sequence of five images uh, depicting two trees of different sizes and himself in relation to the trees. Using the same format of the photograph when depicting the two trees and himself, the size of these three objects appears to be equal. But the other two photographs show different relations. Only by comparison can one deduce the real size of those three objects. Now, Bible called his practice epistemic photography. <clears throat> and like many other conceptual artists of the 1960s and 1970s, he was concerned with the belief in the objective status of photography. These artists then often investigated the modes of visual construction of evidence by focusing on the standards and conventions that govern photography. In a recent essay, Bible summarized this approach in the following words, quote, photography is not a medium through which reality is represented. Photography is a medium used to fabricate knowledge, end of quote. An essential aspect of this observational knowledge then consists in bringing things together and making it possible to compare and measure them uh, one against another. <clears throat> now, uh, Walter Benjamin already hinted uh, at this aspect of photography in his famous artwork essay, saying that the stripping of the veil from the object, the destruction of the aura is the signature of a perception whose sense for all that is the same in the world has so increased that by means of reproduction, it extracts sameness even from what is unique. This is manifested in the field of perception, what in the theoretical sphere is noticeable in the increasing significance of statistics. Uh, to give another example, Susan Sontag in her book on photography voices a similar sentiment when she says that crushed hopes, youth antics, colonial wars and winter sports are alike, are equalized by the camera. Taking photographs has set up a chronic voyeuristic relation to the world, which levels the meaning of all events. <clears throat> now, photography is often understood as a universal equivalent, but we have to realize that to make things commensurable and to stabilize and standardize phenomena, we need techniques of measurement and standardization, <clears throat> which have to be standardized themselves first. Before stating that photographs reduce all sides to relations of formal equivalence or that they level meaning of all events, we have to ask how and why photography has become this universal gauge in the first place. Looking at professional or pre-automatic photography gear and materials, one quickly finds out how essential measuring is photography <clears throat> and that every pretty picture emerges out of sedimented practices of measuring, scaling, grading and calibrating. Every measure then is in principle a commeasure, an operation that brings discrete entities into a relationship 
and so makes it possible to compare and confront them side by side. Photographs constitute spaces of equivalence and commensurability. They define standards of appearance and establish the conditions for comparing things, especially when images circulate within larger administrative and political systems of scaling. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, when we look, for example, at uh, some analysis of larger collections of photographs from Mal Malarose's Imaginary Museum, uh, Warburg's Atlas, or Kant's Archives of the Planet, to the more contemporary approaches in digital humanities. Here is one example from Lev Manovich's uh, Cultural uh, Analytics. We see at another level of photographic measures. Uh, our contemporary network and data, in data intensive phase of image production adds a further infrastructural layer to earlier questions about reproduction and the multiple. Online image sharing platforms not only enable and stimulate image production and circulation, but also make it possible to see the gigantic proportion, proportions of the picture universe while the seeing is itself instrumental to the functioning of the current platform capitalist economy. The digital image, whether photographic or other, is itself already always a quantity that can shift across scales of description, analysis, and comparison in ways that puts measure into focus and in novel ways. The image that contains a multitude of scales of potential interpretation that redefine what counts as a photograph in the age of its quantified calculated image that was in the first place a sensorially sampled bit of light transformed into discrete signals. The photographs have been fundamental in the quantification of cultural reality <clears throat> since their origins in the 19th century. Current electronic and digital images have opened up any image as a multitude of scales of reference, zooming in and out across pixel space and its multitude of combinatorial possibilities. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and time. <clears throat>